Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. This is a special feature of M the Media Project from SM Graves Associates. Uh, and we're talking today on the Scots uh, on the Rocks Politica podcast with my very special guest. We're talking to Travis Benson, who is a field director for Act On Mass. Act On Mass is an organization here focused on transparency in the Massachusetts state legislator, legislature. Uh, Travis, it is a pleasure to have you on this special feature. Glad to be here, Scott. I'm, I'm excited. I'm glad that we connected. And uh, you and I had a little bit of a opportunity this weekend to talk for the first time in greater detail about the work that you're doing. Uh, and it's it certainly got me personally enamored um, uh, with, uh, with the political landscape here in the Commonwealth. I'd like you to first, for our listeners, define uh, the organization and a little bit what you do, and then we'll dig in from there. Awesome. So yeah, uh, in a, a very general sense, uh, Massachusetts, the state is very unique in not being totally transparent with its information, how uh, state reps vote and the information you can access within like uh, the, the workings of the state house. Um, and so the organization Act on Mass it is uh, advocating for a rules change um, in late January to change uh, some of the rules and how the legislature works so that we can see um, how our state reps are voting and we can see information um, within, you know, uh, events that happen within the state house. So we're working throughout the state of Massachusetts in most districts. Um, to bring constituents together with their state reps, because it's a very popular issue, um, to have the constituents' voices heard um, uh, to the state reps, because the entire idea of this whole thing is to bring representation more towards uh, the population of Massachusetts. And what better way of doing that than like bringing the voters to the state reps to hear how they feel about this issue. It would seem to me, first off, the, let's give uh, the opportunity for why. It, 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 for those of us that are relatively or extremely engaged in the political process in the Commonwealth, that might seem like a redundant or absurd question, but let's, let's, let's get into why this, um, perhaps even more so than any other political issue that we're currently facing, is important to accomplish. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so as opposed to like a lot of issues, uh, a lot of organizations advocate within, you know, the legislature, we're advocating for something that's a little more procedural and goes after like the inner workings of how things work. So like the, the legislators themselves, they, every legislative session, which happens every two years, um, they will write the rules of how that session works, how like bills uh, are passed from committee to committee, how the information is dispersed. Um, we are trying to make it so that uh, we, there are amendments filed um, that change the rules, which, which affects how other issues and other bills are passed. Um, you know, a lot of the time, there's just a, not a lot of time for us or the legislators themselves to read what they're voting on there is so there's a lot of bills that are rushed sometimes especially if like you're trying to end the term limits of a speaker which just happens to pass in one day whereas a lot of more important popular legislation legislation which we can get into later like you know safe communities act which um you know has bipartisan support support passed the senate state senate unanimously um just gets stuck in the house for years and years so what we're advocating for is rules changes that would help issues like that, help issues like, you know, um, progressive revenue, you know, environmental uh, issues, um, you know, voter issues, uh, any, any bill you want to get filed within the state house, uh, these rules changes um, would help uh, pass more effectively, efficiently, and represent like the, the, the general consensus of the population. It, you know, it seems to me that with a less uh, transparent legislative process, a couple of things can happen. Number one, we live in a world, both at the state level and the federal level, uh, where increasingly over the last 
especially the last 40 or 50 years, um, there's a lot more of these, the, the concept of the omnibus bills, <laughs> which are bills that have any number of different, um, relative, uh, in a different world might be different pieces of legislation. They are uh, some related to each other, some not. And then within each pieces of legislation in that omnibus bill, there are little tenets of law that get uh, placed in there. On occasion, the average voting citizen might hear um, uh, you know, quip in the news and say, how did that get included? How did, how did it, a provision uh, specific to a, an environmental issue in my county or my municipality end up in a state piece of legislation related to transportation or related to finance, right? And you say, well, the, the, you know, so there's this indication of perhaps with more transparency, we would understand why, how, how these things all interrelate or if they even interrelate at all and they're really just being hidden especially more controversial provisions might be hidden in pieces of legislation. Conversely, because we also um, have limitations in how we interact, how the legislative process in interacts with media, people will decide to support or not support really groundbreaking issues. The TCI, you know, the, the gas tax and, uh, and, and more broadly, uh, TCI legislation related to climate change is an example where we really haven't for the average voter, I don't feel, picked it apart so that people really understand all of its provisions and understand that we could potentially debate any number of those provisions before they become a law so that the law becomes more nuanced and fair and effective for all the regions of the state. So I'm wondering if you could speak to those two things. Yeah, yeah, that that's a good uh, point you brought up is like the there is not a lot of room for the picking apart or the debating of things. Um, you mentioned amendments, generally speaking, you just can't see how they're voted on. Um, there's no time to read them uh, most of the time before like putting them on a bill. Um, and I, I, I can talk about the specific rules changes that would help that um, like a little after this, but like, uh, so for instance, uh, on the grand bargain bill, which uh, was voted on two years ago, I believe, um, it was to raise minimum wage to $15 an hour. Mm -hmm. It was, it just had no action for like months. And then, uh, there were changes to it. Um, and it was introduced to a vote. And one of the changes was that it removed time and a half for workers, uh, on holidays and I believe weekends. And, um, then it was voted on and it passed. And so in a day, so there was no time for anyone to react, be like, hey, you know, that that hurts me, that hurts my coworkers. Um, why was that introduced to, like, who introduced that? Um, and we still can't to this day go in and check and see how, like, who voted uh, for, you know, that bill to begin with. Um, so there's not a lot of, of like, like you and me are more, involved with the process than probably a lot of other people. It's very dry and nerdy. Um, but, but we're but, still in the dark. You just indicated so we, two steps where there's the, there's the procedural process, but then there's also, well, how do we do the follow-up when you can't really find quite all the information you would need to do the follow-up? Exactly. Even for people who are like very into it, want to figure out how things work, it's still obscure and like uh, we were talking to, we actually talked to a state rep the other day because we've been holding, we held like 50 meetings um, this past month. And one of our, in one of our meetings, uh, they, the state rep mentioned that they couldn't, they couldn't like see how a bill uh, they cared about was like voted on in a committee. And it's like, they couldn't see. And it's like, I mean, we can't see. <laughs> but what does, that, what does that say about like when state reps themselves can't see like how they wrote it on? That speaks to something. I, so I have friends and peers over the years, you know, they're now elected officials at the municipal level, at the state level um, in various districts. And all of them at various points in the past have, have spoken to exactly that. So these are people who are on the inside, you would think. Um, and they, the complaint is generally, you know, I, you know, I support transparency. And in fact, I've been burned by it a few times because we're forced to really make a decision after we haven't had adequate opportunity 
time frame wise to to assess. Um, and it's always it, it always seems to be by surprise. You know, you and your advisors have I think people don't realize when you're a, when you're a, in, in Congress in Washington, you have a certain type of level of budget for which to have advisors and so forth and your your clerks and and they are able to do a lot of that digging. Although I, I don't think it's done well, and I don't think policymakers are reading well enough in a lot of cases. But technically speaking, now if you become a state rep at most state houses in the United States, you you, you simply don't have that level of budget for staffing. You, it, and at the municipal level, you you just simply don't have it. In fact, in most cases, you don't have any staff, and yet it's not a paid position. And if it is a paid position, it's usually a stipend. So we're not giving um, law policymakers enough time to actually read through things. And then um, other leaders make take advantage of that, I think. Yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot to that. There's a lot of influences that state representatives face that, um, you know, affect how, how they feel about how they vote. Um, the I'll add on to what you just said, the police reform bill that was voted on a couple of weeks ago, like, whether you have enough staff or aides or not, like that was voted on less than 24 hours and it was over like 120 pages. Like advocacy, like there were advocacy groups and like state reps and their aides staying up all night for that thing. Um, the, and there, it is more, it is more than like time allowed to vote for these as well. Um, I guess I, so, I can get into like a little bit of the weeds of like what we're advocating for specifically in January that like we think would help uh, the process itself help these bills come to fruition. Please do. That's why we're here. Yes. Yeah. So there's so there's three amendments, um, and one of them one of them is to make committee votes public. So I'll really quickly just explain like how a bill goes through the state legislature. Um, a, a law is introduced by uh, a legislator. Um, it then goes to a committee. When a bill is in that committee, it's either voted to, you know, um, progress or it's uh, voted uh, against or it's sent to a study. Fun facts, not a lot, like barely any laws are ever voted uh, adversely in committees. When a bill is sent to study, um, it, it is essentially a euphemism for killing a bill. There, most bills are sent to study, which means they're probably not going to pass. They're probably going to be delayed for years. It's, it's pretty much a bill graveyard. A proverbial base in Alaska we're going to send you to. Exactly. So people don't hear from you. <laughs> Okay. That's not what I'm going to picture every time I think about it. <laughs> So if, if, if a law is lucky enough to make it out of committee, it'll go to the Senate and the House for a floor vote. And uh, again, there's a couple things that make it difficult to see what happens to a bill in that area. And then when it makes it out of the Senate and the House, it goes to the governor for him to sign it. So we're focusing on like the committee, the committee's part, as well as the state House floor vote part because we think that's like where a lot of transparency lacks. Generally speaking, the state Senate does a lot of these things better. Most, most legislation gets delayed indefinitely, watered down or not voted on most of the time from the state house. So that's why we're uh, advocating for state house rules changes in late January. And those rules changes, they are to allow um, committee votes and testimony to be public, which is already a thing that exists in 27 other states. Um, it exists in the state Senate. Uh, and it, it just allows you to see how these bills are voted on, who, like who votes for or against these bills within committees. So if the Safe Communities Act makes it, uh, doesn't make it out of committee or makes it out of committee, you can see who voted specifically for that to happen, um, which is a huge reason a lot of bills just don't make it out of committee. So that's a really big one. That's a really popular one. Mm. Uh, there was there was a ballot question referendum I can get into a little later about like how big this popular support is for that. Second Amendment is um, for just allowing more time 
for a bill before it's voted on. There's a lot of bills that just end up being rushed within 24 hours. Can't see what happened. You know, police reform bill, grand bargain bill, uh, the 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 law to uh, eliminate speaker limits. Um, they were all rushed, and those are big. Those are big things to vote for for that were rushed. So we are advocating for at least 72 hours for a bill before it's voted on so that the public, the press and the legislatures themselves can like have time to read and react to these things. Third amendment and the last amendment is to uh, make it easier to see votes in the state house when it comes to a floor vote. So when a bill is voted on in the state house, um, there's the opportunity to do a roll call, which is okay, state reps will stand in order to say, I want this vote to be public. Massachusetts has the ninth highest uh, roll call threshold in the entire country, where we require 16 state reps to stand up in a matter of seconds to say, I want this bill, I want this vote to be public. That is, you know, you compare that to Pennsylvania, which requires two state reps to stand, Texas requires one. Um, it, it, it's a very, again, another uniquely Massachusetts thing. So I'll, I'll, most bills that are voted on in the state house are not recorded as well. Um, and that is- that, Over and over, not, not to interrupt you, but it's interesting in the various small myriad ways our legislative procedures are not speaking to our modern sense of the forward and progressive ideals of a common, a modern definition of a Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's a very, you're, that's so spot on. Uh, you can actually see that, that disconnect uh, a lot during uh, elections. Most, uh, like a huge amount of challengers Run, and this is like very defining for challengers compared to incumbents, people who have been in there for a long time. Uh, a lot of challengers and newcomers run like hard on the issue of transparency um, because they're, again, even if you're running against, like whether you're running against a progressive Democrat, more conservative Democrat, whoever, um, if they've been in there for a while, if they have a higher leadership position, if they have a higher paid position, Generally speaking, there's a pattern of them being less and less for transparency because tr advocating for transparency really challenges the status quo. Yeah. So a lot of challengers and newcomers, they'll be like, listen, you know, my, my, the current seated rep might be for 100% renewables. They might say they are for, you know, this, they might be for that but we can't pass this legislation uh, if we can't see what's going on. I want to change like how we're able to see what is going on. So like it just, it's become more and more popular of an issue. Two years ago, two of these amendments were already voted on. Mm. So there's already support in that. Um, it, it was already, they need, I, they need like an 81, 81 votes in order to, in order to pass. They got about around 50, 55. Um, from the state reps themselves. So there's already, there's already support behind it. We're just like, Act on Mass is just adding to that support. Um, mm -hmm. Why we're reaching out to state reps throughout the country. And That's what's the third amendment? Third amendment is to reduce the threshold. Oh yeah, it's to reduce the threshold for a roll call vote. So like- okay, So that is require, the third amendment. Yeah, so we require 16 state reps to stand right now. We wanna lower it to eight, which is what the state Senate already does. Um, we, that's like, t we require 10% of, uh, our state reps to stand for a roll call. Most other states require 5%, which is like around, depending on the state, but you need like three, four, five people to stand. Right. Yeah. It, it reminds me of the, um, the scene in the Broadway musical 1776, when, uh, they, uh, are depending upon the delegate from Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins, who walks into the room after going to the privy and he says, and I'm paraphrasing, um, you know, there is nothing on God's green earth that can't be debated and then voted on, right? They want it. So there's people that want to prevent the debate so because they don't want to move to get to a vote. And, and he walks in and says, there's nothing 
so sacred that we can't pick it apart and and then vote on it, right? You know, it's like, why create thresholds that force votes in a certain way or the lack thereof? You know, it's yeah. just, it, it, all of these small, the, they yeah. almost voted. It, they almost voted to make it forty people standing during COVID this summer. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, they were going to vote on that. I didn't know that. So forty members of the House would be. Uh, so eight. Uh, you now you said eight. Uh, that would be ten percent of the of the of the Senate, correct? So what would what what would forty be as a percentage of of House members? That would be one fourth. There's 160 of them, so 40 of them would be one fourth of them. Oh my God! Okay, yeah, yeah, that would break a lot more records for Massachusetts. Do you think that um, the level or lack thereof in engagement uh, of the average citizen uh, is is in part uh, there's there's not one reason for this in my opinion, but 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 that one key part is is that people feel like even if they were a part of the process that the process has not been designed for them, and that there seem to be all of these inherent challenges to being engaged. And after a while, people just uh, between that and the behavior of certain members of the House, Senate, uh, whatever branch of government. And, and in this regard, I think Massachusetts is better than many other states and certainly better than the federal government at this time. There's less uh, drama and there's less uh, political theatrics, um, depending on where you live, I suppose. But you, know, there, you put the two together and people just say, I, I can't be a part of this. And I won't be a part of it. And if they do then vote, they really don't know what they're voting for most times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, it's tricky in Massachusetts. Cause like you said, there's are there isn't a whole bunch of theatrics unless you count like the three last speakers uh, leaving. Cause they were convicted of like, you know, uh, fraud and corruption. Yeah. That's but, right like, up there, by the way, I think, you know, that's right up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This, uh, what DeLeo, DeLeo making it out as a speaker without like, uh, getting convicted of anything was a good thing for Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, so that says a lot itself. But uh, yeah, so what you just said, there's a huge disconnect between like what the people of Massachusetts want and what is actually voted on. And that is disheartening and that disenfranchises a lot of people. It doesn't seem bad from the outset, but once you start to like see how things are work, things work, like we have a democratic mass, we have a democratic supermajority in the state house on the party platform they say we should have election day voter registration it's been it's been filed for 15 years and it has still not passed and it's on their party platform that brings so they're, me not, so they're not even doing the bare minimum of like what's on their platform sorry that what were you saying me, that brings me to a, a question i had for you that i was thinking about this weekend which is it seems to me in my memory i'm 44 and in the time that I've been a voting citizen of the Commonwealth, there are at least um, four distinct moments I seem to remember where, um, where items like that were put to a referendum vote. We voted for them in a, in, a, in a November election along with our elected officials and that those referendums have never been enacted. And it seems to me that there are several times in our past that that's happened. Am I crazy? Or did I misinterpret or was I misinformed about exactly how those referendums would work? Because one would think um, in any state that when you, when, you, when you vote for or against a particular referendum vote and it passes according to the number of votes it received, that it would then be immediately enacted uh, during the next term of the, of the legislature. The people have spoken, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, I was actually, yeah, that's a very good uh, segue. I was gonna bring that up as well. Um, are, are you talking about a specific referendum? Well, um, I, um, I am, and uh, of course, I didn't write down the uh -huh. the um, the the uh, nomenclature so that I could say it's act X Y Z or whatnot. But but it's common. That's it's not uncommon. The the I believe at least once in in the you know twenty five years I've been voting that there was a referendum uh, on, it was either term limits or in some other way to limit, um, to limit either members of the House or Senate, you know, and, and how many contiguous terms they could have. Um, and I could be wrong about that. The, the, there were also this tax legislation more recently that we mm -hmm. voted on in referendum. Yep. And to my knowledge, we, we never enacted that act either. 
Yeah, so this is this is a little bit, this is just like a quick tangent, but I, I do know that a couple years ago, um, there was a referendum for uh, public financing for those who run for office because Massachusetts, yes. Massachusetts is one of the other things it's very not good at compared to other states is challenging incumbents in the state um, because of the lack of information of like knowing how your state reps vote. It's hard to be like, well, they vote for this. I'm going to vote for this. So I'm challenging them. Two, there is just a, we're, we're one of 10 states where it's like a full-time job and you get compensated good for it. There's a lot of time commitment. Um, and so there's a, a lot of, there's a lot of um, interest in, you know, preserving those positions. Um, so that, anyways, that referendum that was for public financing for those running for office, it passed, the voters voted for it. And then they just decided to not do it, <laughs> which uh, was like, okay, they just, they just voted against it. Like, right after that. And, and so, I think I think that the vast majority of people, because we are where we are with the amount of disengagement, um, I think that folks just assume that it was passed, <laughs> that the will of the people would have been enacted. Yeah. And they didn't do any follow up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So they're, they're definitely, so they're, and I do want to make, I guess, a distinction for anyone listening who's not into this kind of stuff. But so for referendums, it's basically like, hey, we want to put this on the ballot since like our legislator is not doing it. Um, I'm putting it a little crassly, but it, it's more like, so like, okay, the people should vote for this. Let's see what the people want. Right. Um, there are different types of it. There's non-binding referendums, uh, which is, you know, it, it's kind of like, here, let's sample like what the people want. It's, it's kind of like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like a survey, yeah. But it's a symbolic survey. It shows yeah. you know our leaders like what their constituents want. And then there is binding referendums, which is you know if the people vote for it, it it is it is enacted. Um, so there there actually there was a transparency um, ballot initiative, a referendum this November. Um, it was in sixteen different districts. And it asked, it was non-binding, um, but it asked the people, do you want to make committee votes public? Do you want the, the information on websites? And in all 16 districts during overwhelming voter turnout, you know, in, in you know, within conservative districts and more progressive districts, 90% of the people voted yes in favor of making committee votes public. So that's like, it's like a very popular bipartisan issue um, that we want to see be represented within the house itself as well. If, if that many people are for it, we, sh we would think that, you know, our representation should also represent that as well. So like what we're doing has huge amount of popular support. We're just showing our leaders, this is how popular it is. Um, because a lot of, I don't want to get too much into it, but when, when you, when you do enter the house, um, or enter any, a chamber for that matter, there becomes a lot of different pressures that you don't normally have with your colleagues and leadership and your bosses. Um, and a lot of the times uh, that influences how our, our leaders vote more so than like how uh, the public influences them, which, you know, is ideally what we want them to be representing. So we're bringing the pressure of the public to them to make, to be like, I know you face like a lot of pressure um, within your job, but like, you know, we we are we are the voices. We are what helps get you elected, and we we do want to see these things. We want to support you and help you do a better job. But these are the things that are important to us. Right. Um, and and one one last thing, and as far as like referendums go, um, well, I guess not as referendums, but for like popular support. So um, another big thing for Massachusetts is we've been cutting taxes for the past. 40 years. Um, we have a very flat tax rate, but we do not tax the wealthy. Um, and we've been cutting back on that for decades and decades, more so than any other state except Alabama and Alaska. Or, uh, so it's Alaska and another A state. I confuse the A states a lot. But anyways. Um, but we're not in so, good company on that. <laughs> on that front. Yeah, it could be, it could be better. So it's, it's actually, 
Alaska and Arizona. Okay. Um, and just recently, um, thanks to like actually some good organizing within the state house and some really good state reps, there was a roll call vote on a capital gains tax, um, mm. in, in which is very popular amongst um, constituents, bipartisan again, you know, basically just like, please tax the wealthy. Um, and so that vote was recorded and most state reps voted against it. And it was very disheartening to see that. And that was another huge disjunct between like, it, it's like over 70% of people want capital gains to be increased in Massachusetts. And like, you see, you know, we got, we luckily got this vote recorded, which doesn't happen most of the time on this issue where most state reps voted against it. And it's like, where, why is there that disconnect? And this is the disconnect we don't get to see all the time because we can't see how votes are go. Most That's correct. Time. Yep, yep. So that's what we're addressing. Um, a little bit on uh, how you got into this. You worked for the, uh, the Sanders campaign. Uh, was that the, the 2016 campaign or the most recent campaign or both? Most recent. Most recent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a little bit on the organization, how long has uh, Act on Mass been at this? And get a little bit into the mechanics. Uh, so just so our listeners understand exactly how it all works. And then finally, you know, how they could get engaged. Yes, yes. So uh, Act on Mass has been at this. So this is one of their campaigns. They did another campaign a while ago called the Voters Deserve to No Pledge, which reached out to reps individually to ask for them to pledge to make their own votes public and, you know, for them to stand for roll call on bills that they co-sponsor. Um, so Acton Mass has been the leading organization on transparency um, in Massachusetts for a couple of years now. Um, so as of right now, the past month and a half since we started this campaign, uh, we've had over 2,000 volunteers sign on to meet with their state reps throughout the entire state. Um, we've had 50 meetings so far. We have another 35 scheduled. Um, I believe 23 state reps are now committed with only three saying, giving us hard no's. We're still putting pressure on escalating in uh, the ones, the districts where we've met so far. Um, and additionally, there's 30 Republican state reps who will most likely vote for these as well. So we're pretty much around like 53 signed on to, to commit so far out of like the 81 majority we need. Um, and, uh, you know, we're only building momentum through that. So it's, it's very exciting. Um, we, uh, we, uh, do you want me to plug now or later or like, how much do you want me to get into? Plug away, brother. <laughs> cool, cool. I'll plug, yeah, I'll, I'll plug it anytime. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so anyone who's like interested, it's, it's very, it's very, uh, it's a very unique experience, honestly. Anyone who's like interested in meeting their state rep, like sitting down with them in a group and talking to them about the issue of transparency, wanting to see public votes and how important it is to you, um, feel free to check out like Act on Mass's website. That's actonmass.org slash campaign. Mm -hmm um and so check that out there because there is a sign up where you can sign on to your district team to meet with your state rep as well as uh, there's a cool little visual map to see like how many state reps have signed on to the commitment so far and right. you can check out if your rep has signed on or not and uh you know decide to get involved to call or email your rep as well great and um, for our listeners, this will be on uh, our episode page for this special feature. Uh, and, um, you know, you'll be able to connect to Act On Mass uh, from there uh, in a variety of ways, just in case you missed it while you were listening. Um, and we do uh, highly encourage, frankly, um, we don't give uh, partisan endorsements from Scott's on the Rocks Politica, but we do use our show to get people engaged as much as possible and people that are already asking serious questions about how does my government work? Uh, how can I get more involved? What types of things should I really be focusing my attention to? Um, especially in these times where the forces that be, I think sometimes are trying to get us on as unfocused as possible. And it just feels like there's a flurry of 
of information coming at you, most of it meaningless, we try to offer a little bit of, hey, you know, we're not going to tell you what to do, but, you know, you might want to take a look at this and here's why. So I really thank you, Travis, for coming on today um, and explaining uh, what the campaign looks like right now. Um, I want to point out to our listeners, this is one of the few uh, campaigns that's ongoing uh, that's not a specific social issue, uh, it's procedural. And, and for that, uh, and that alone, it is probably, if we could really turn this around, uh, it would have such a dramatic effect for generations to come on the way we do government. And as good as things can be relative to other states in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts, everybody can always do better, right? And this is an example of how we must absolutely do better for ourselves. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I actually want to throw in a quick correction to what I said about the URL. Sure. Uh, so check out actonmass.org, um, specifically actonmass.org slash the hyphen campaign. So ah, the hyphen okay. campaign. Yeah. Got to get that right. Quick and we'll have that. We quick will correct. also have that correct on the Scots on the Rocks Politica uh, episode page. <laughs> Travis yeah, Benson, sure act, act on right Mass. Uh, it has been an absolute pleasure having you here. I hope you'll come back sometime uh, because um, I'm, I got a feeling this is going to be an ongoing issue for many years to come. Yeah, the, this is a very modest uh, start to a long-term uh, fight. Um, after this, there'll be there'll be more advocacy for changes in the state house. Um, so we, we look forward to it. Thank you for having me on. It's wonderful that you're willing to, you know, help spread the word. Like that's, thank you for that. That's what we're about. Um, uh, folks, you have been listening to a special feature of Scots on the Rocks Politica, a project of M the Media Project, where we are uh, looking to support local and regional journalism and help out all of our engaged citizens. You can find out all of our information at smgravesassociates.com slash podcasts. Uh, once again, Travis Benson, Act On Mass. I'm your host, Scott M. Graves. Thank you for listening.